So welcome everybody to this episode of EA TV and we'll be doing a wrap up of today's plenary which was men's health as a catchphrase. We talked about marketing versus evidence in this area and we are joined today by Professor Herman and Professor Foda who will wrap this session up for you. So we'll start by Professor Herman. We talked about ejaculating sparing BPH surgery. So my question for you is, is ejaculation a good endpoint in this kind of surgery? It is I think one important endpoint, uh, the the evidence is accumulating that it's a big concern of our patients. And the if we look into patient preferences, of course, there's a, a need to to heed that in mind if you discuss and counsel your patient for treatment. And um, I think this point has been raised by the introduction of new technologies that have addressed this topic very nicely. And I think um, it's not like a god-like thing, so you get TRP and you get retrograde ejaculation. Now you have the options. At least the option is brought to the public and the patients ask for it. And uh, the, the title of this, uh, this session was very good, Marketing, I think comes in here because the patients get aware of it by public media that there are treatments around. And so therefore, I think it's a good endpoint and we need to discuss this endpoint with our patients because we need to take them serious. I completely agree. And we indeed had good discussions about that. So can you summarize what techniques we have available for, for rendering patients so we, treating patients in this? Yeah, so we have, a, we have a range of technology, technology that's called ultra new minimal invasive technologies like uh, Eurolift or Resum or Aqua Ablation or ITIN. So these are the products and um, they are marketed under. And um, these are, on one hand, these are, if we talk about ITIN or, or um or uh, Eurolift, these are implantable devices. These are mechanical devices that do not ablate technology, uh, ablate tissue of the transitional zone. And we have ablative technology like Resum, uh, with uh, which is treating tissue of the transitional zone by vap not vaporizing, but by uh, boiling it in the end, so that uh, there will be a subsequent necrosis. And e and we have, of course, with uh, treatments like aqua ablation, we have. Um, also an ablation, this time with water steam, not steam, but with water uh, that is directed as an ablative agent. So that is those treatment we have, and they have raised the not only the concern, but the interest of our patients. And then we have, of course, uh, other treatments that have been there before. There have been um, publications on resection, modifications of resection or vaporization with uh, conventional, nowadays conventional uh, energy sources. And we have the third field of robotic or laparoscopic treatments that do deobstructive surgery respecting the anatomy as such. There will be integrate ejaculation to a larger proportion than if you don't respect that. So we have a variety from ultra mini invasive to, let's say, minimal invasive in the sense of laparoscopy. And that is a range we can discuss with our patients. So we have a lot of different treatments. What was raised as well during the plenary is that we can try a staged approach. So we can start with like ultra minimal invasive. And then if that fails in turn, we can do like a resection or an enucleation, which, which we can try to do in, uh, ejaculating sparing. Is that an approach you would support? And is there any EAU guidance on this? No, EAU guidance is not there at the moment for that because, the, as said, we have a lot of treatments and the evidence that has accumulated is on different stages. So this is why we only have uh, one remark on it in the, in the guidelines for Europe, for example, because they could prove really that in their field of indication, they can provide a very good rate, virtually zero retrograde ejaculation uh, in the studies. We have a lot of five-year studies, but we have very little comparative studies for that. And if you do comparative studies, we've discussed this this morning as well, the comparator is interesting. So you can tailor your comparator according to the target volume you, for example, address with TRP. And we know from different studies that you can do TRP this way. And you can do TRP that way. So, for example, the difference between TRP arm of uh, water one and Goliath study, for example, is almost double 
in the Goliath study, 25% TRP addressed volume versus 58%. So if we look into these comparators, of course, you have to interpret the data as such, especially when it comes to retreatment rates. Thank you very much. So, Professor Forde, as uh, somebody who is a uroandrologist by training, how do you feel about preserving ejaculation as an endpoint? How important is it, ejaculation for a man? No, I think uh, I think the perfect point has been raised that 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 we're walking towards uh, uh, asking patients more what do they feel. So maybe it doesn't matter so much what I feel about somebody's ejaculations. It ha it matters what the patient feels about his ejaculations. So it's going to be very different for different patients. Somebody just want their urinary problems taken care of and they're not concerned about ejaculation, then probably we shouldn't do the minimally invasive treatments. They're both too expensive and, and maybe not uh, the optimal treatments to treat the urinary problems uh, always. But if somebody's very concerned, and, and men can be concerned for several reasons, there's both sexual satisfaction, the feeling with ejaculation. Some men are very interested in having the ejaculate. It's very important for some men uh, to the point where some men are actually happy with uh, a little bit of urinary incontinence following a radical prostatectomy um, during sexual intercourse because that is like an ejaculation. So that is how much it matters to some men. And then, as, as uh, Professor Dean Eltzman was discussing this morning, some men might want to start a family. And then, obviously, an integrated ejaculation is going to be very important for at least a couple of years. And then a subject that was discussed that's really at this interface of marketing versus evidence, at least in my opinion it is, uh, therapies that are marketed for men's health, such as erectile dysfunction, injectables, regenerative medicine. There was a debate on that. You were one of the, of the speakers in the debate. Can you summarize the debate and the both viewpoints that were raised there? Yeah, so the debate on this is very, very interesting, I think. We had a, a short case of a young patient that wanted to be cured for his erectile dysfunction. When Viagra came... Now, many years ago, it was considered a miracle, but now a lot of patients are very unhappy with taking pills, so they want an actual cure. And this regenerative medicine is kind of promising that cure. So um, there is uh, very few studies looking at uh, the issue. It's either uh, stem cell containing aspirates uh, taken from different parts of the body or other people's bodies, or it is uh, platelet-rich plasma always taken from the patient himself. So there are very little actual studies, and I think it was very telling that my opponent in the debate uh, had a, a slide where he did a Google search, and he found 37 billion hits on platelet-rich plasma. I did a search on PubMed on clinical trials. I had two hits on that search. So that the, that's a discrepancy. There is a lot of marketing, and this is something that patients really want. It's also something clinicians want. It's great to be able to offer your patients, I'm going to give you an injection and cure your erectile dysfunction. It's what everybody wants. But uh, so, so to summarize the debate, basically, um, and my point today was that the data is just not there. We had nine small studies only looking at safety and um, I mean, if you're even able to do the injections with the stem cells, not looking at efficacy at all. So no conclusions there, absolutely no conclusions. And on PRP, we have two small randomized trials. One of them, in my opinion, hugely problematic for several different reasons. So we have very little evidence. And then we started discussing, and I think this is interesting, we started discussing combining different regenerative uh, medical therapies. So combining PRP and shockwave therapy specifically. And there are no trials on that. So we're moving on to combination therapy because before we have the individual therapies uh, proven and before we even have trials in combination therapy. But it's being promoted and people want it. So like always, or like so many times, more research is needed before we can adopt this therapy and give it to patients. And there was a call for younger investigators to get involved in, in this field and do this research. There was a nice talk of uh, Professor Faisal Yafi from Orange County on wearables. Can you also give your comments or your thoughts on that uh, lecture? Yeah, so so mainly it's the same. It's uh, it's it's as the title of the session was "Men's Health as a Catchphrase," and and is this all marketing? And that's the idea. And there are a lot of uh, wearables coming out, just like there are wearables for everything else. Uh, 
a lot of wearables for cardiovascular health. There's now a lot of wearables for penile health. And basically, there are a couple of categories. There are the classical stretching devices that you can walk around with. They might make your penis a little bit longer, um, which is a little bit debatable. Not many patients can, can tolerate to have these devices on for a long time. But then there are new ones. Uh, and we all know these things like the Fitbit or the Apple Watch. But basically, there are new wearables that, that measure the same thing for your penis, so the health of your penis. So you can wear a device all night and see if you get good erections during the night, which I think is, I mean, it's an interesting concept and, 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 and maybe we can also use it in the clinic, but we do need more data on that. And then we have a couple of new devices for um, the premature ejaculation, especially there are some interesting stuff coming out of Israel with a little patch that stimulates the pelvic floor muscles that might have a clinical benefit. But, but again, it's the same thing, right? People want this, but we need the data to see if it actually works. So I think we have to be careful and we want the data before everybody's using it because otherwise this can be very careful, to, very difficult, sorry, to get that data uh, in the end. So lots of new techniques, lots of new gadgets, devices, but we should learn how to integrate these in our clinical practice and we should have the robust evidence to do so. Certainly. And I, and I also think that it, it's important for clinicians to know about these devices, even though there's no evidence because patients are going to be coming in and asking about yeah. them. And I think one, one aspect is also important because we have been talking about the new myths. And I must say, uh, they have a very good... They have a very good point in addressing this topic. But again, uh, of course, we're in Europe. We probably can afford this. And you, you raised the question, which I didn't answer before. Do we stage procedures or can we do recurrent procedures? Of course, you can do that. But one thing is for sure, if we look into our healthcare systems, which, uh, which uh, at some stage are based on solidary payments, uh, then we also need to look onto long-term efficacy. So that is uh, what I have the feeling. So first of all, if ejaculation is a topic in Europe, it is of course a topic everywhere in the world. And I think, and this is what I believe uh, is our um, responsibility to guarantee that these needs are met everywhere. And uh, if we look into the population dynamics and into demography in the future, there will be more people, more active people, uh, but even more older people. And these people will probably not be in Europe. They will be in the rest of the world. So what I feel is very important that we take this topic serious. We have at the moment robust data on at least two of these new myths, but we know that there are other treatments out there. We need to investigate them as well. Maybe they are not so attractive for marketing, but they provide us with a skill set to meet those needs. Thank you very much for your comments. I would like to thank you both for being here today, wrapping up the plenary session at the last day of the conference. So um, thank you very much for being here. And uh, thanks to the viewer and we will see you next year.